Happy New Year. Welcome to American Issues Take One. It's 2024. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is, in 2024, the Supreme Court of the United States decides Trump's future. Uh, 2024 will be an interesting year for many of us, and especially for Donald Trump, as he entertains 91 criminal indictments. And of recent, the two, main, uh, two very important cases that need to be determined is one is whether or not Donald Trump will be allowed um, on the ballot in, in many states in the, the United States. And secondly, whether or not uh, Trump is immune from his activities while serving as president of the United States. And to discuss those two topics, with me is my co-host, Jay Fidel. Good morning, Jay. Wow, what a show, what a subject. Glad what to be subject. with you, Tim, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to diving uh, diving into this one because, you know, um, two years ago after um, the election, you and I on this show and your show uh, discussed many times the 14th Amendment, Section 3. And I, we could probably say confidently that the media wasn't picking up on it. Uh, they are now. And they are now spe specifically because the state of Maine, uh, the Secretary of State, said Donald Trump is not eligible to serve as a candidate on the election for 2024. And the Colorado State Supreme Court said the exact same thing. So we have two states in the union that said he shall not pass. Uh, so the question is whether or not uh, the states get to uh, stick with their opinions, or is it challenged up the um, appeals court and or to the Supreme Court? Uh, your thought on, 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 on the dilemma of where this thing goes, the uh, 14th Amendment, Section 3, and how it applies to Donald Trump, and whether no Donald Trump gets to remain on the ballot. That's, that's multiple compound question, Tim. Uh, uh, that's me... how I like to ask him, because that's <laughs> how you do it to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, where is it going? Well, you have Colorado, which is state Supreme Court, um, and you have uh, Maine, um, which is, um, you know, just a, a, an elections official. Um, but they both had evidentiary hearings uh, at the Colorado General Jurisdiction Court before it got to the Colorado Supreme Court. Um, and in Maine, the uh, elections officer had a, a significant evidentiary hearing. So they both had mm, triers of fact, if you will, on the question primarily of whether this was an insurrection, um, which seems to be a kind of uh, obvious anyway. Um, then there are two states that, that, that ruled the other way, that said he is entitled to be on the ballot. One of them is California and the other is Michigan. Um, so you can see it's a kind of political uh, you're not sure. I mean, t to me, I don't see the Colorado case as uh, as as political. I don't see uh, the main case as political. Um, Republicans are involved in those in those uh, two cases, you know, as the people who who brought the action, so to speak. Um, I don't know about Calif California. I don't know exactly what happened there, and I don't know about Michigan, but I suspect that there were political maneuverings there. In any event, um, it's a very interesting question as to how this is going to play out. You know, if you look at abortion, you know, the Supreme Court said, okay, there's no, you know, constitutional right to abortion, uh, so we don't let the states decide. So they, they let it go into chaos, state by state, which was, a, you know, a ridiculous decision, but that's what we have. Now you have a situation where the Supreme Court could say, well, um, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're going to let it go back to the states and uh, let the states decide. That would be chaos in the election um, because, you know, it's not, not clear whether there would be uh, a lot of states or a few states that would vote this way or that way with regard to their judicial decisions. However, this is a constitutional amendment. This question is decided under a constitutional amendment, and it's, it's easy to say. Um, that this this should be a national decision, because the vote we are talking about is national, um, and so I would I would expect a Supreme Court will you know rule on this, and b um, that it will find wh wh whether it goes this way or that way, it'll find that its ruling governs all states. So um, I think it's clear that uh, the Supreme Court will take it and and will. Um, hand down a decision that affects all states one way or the other. 
The question then is whether the Supreme Court will rule that he's on the ballot or off the ballot. Uh, and that's what we should talk about today. Uh, but keep in mind that Clarence, uh, uh, Clarence doesn't want um, Trump to be off the ballot, and he will try to get his Republican um, and uh, politicized majority on the court to vote with him. Um, and he will not recuse himself, even though his wife was involved in the Trump campaign and the insurrection. She was involved in the insurrection. It's kind of interesting that uh, da uh, Clarence would uh, opine on the insurrection when his wife was an active and personal participant in the insurrection. Um, but they're going to have to decide one way or the other, I think, and it's going to have to be a national decision. And I think if I were to guess, and it's a sad guess, really, um, that they will vote to leave Trump on the ballot, which which is an absurdity. Because can I ask um, our engineer, Michael Bangalinen, to put the language up on the screen? Uh, and if you don't mind, in answer to your question, I would like to read that language. Okay. Um, okay. Section three, disqualification from holding office. I, I'm going to read it because I think it's short and I think every word counts. And um, they call it a post-Civil War amendment. Um, but you know what? Um, th that's kind of an insult to it. It's an amendment. It was passed pursuant to the provisions for amending the Constitution. Um, it was uh, not simultaneous with the adoption of the Constitution itself. And so what? It was post-Civil War. So what? Um, would, would that make it less effective or more effective than it was incorporated in, in the Constitution itself? And the answer is no. It's part of the Constitution. It doesn't matter when it was, was uh, adopted. Anyway, it says, no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president. Here's the good part. Or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or, any, or under any state who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States, or as a member of any state legislature, or as an executive or judicial officer of any state, to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof, but Congress may, by vote of two-thirds of each House, remove such disability. And I guess one issue is uh, whether this was an insurrection, but, um, you know, for, for any court, in my view, um, to find that it was not an insurrection is to deny what we all saw with our eyes, a violent insurrection against the Congress. No question about it. We saw it. The evidence has been made clear. And it was investigated by the Select Committee in Congress. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we are all witness to what happened. All of us. Well, if you remember the uh, district case, the district court case, where the judge accepted the findings of facts about the insurrection, and that wasn't the issue. Um, that judge in the district court said Trump may remain on the ballot because of a, uh, the issue about officer. Well, that's going to resolve that. I'm yeah. breaking this down piece by piece. So, um, first of all, this was an insurrection. I don't know how any reasonable, thoughtful person who reads and, and speaks the English language could find otherwise, okay? In the United States, it's so clear. And yet, there are people who say, well, maybe it's not an insurrection. Um, or maybe it requires, a, you know, a criminal conviction. Um, Section 3 doesn't talk about criminal conviction. It says insurrection. That's all it says. And engaged in, well, we saw him um, incite the insurrection. I would say that's engaging. Um, and, we, and we know full well that he went back to his office um, and he watched it without doing anything to, to uh, stop it for hours. And then he said, they love me. Huh? They love me. I mean, he had a relationship with him and evidence has come out, uh, you know, that he was actually... Um, he and his people are actually involved in organizing the insurrection. I mean, the evidence is all over the lot. So any any court, I can't imagine a court 
a judge or a jury finding this was not an insurrection. But, you know, that's an issue in front of the Supreme Court, or will be. The next point, your point a minute ago, is uh, uh, is, is, is Trump an off is a president an officer of the United States? Can we see that language one more time? Okay, it says, or hold any office under the United States. That's the second and third line there. Okay, then it refers to an officer of the United States. When you, when you take that together, somebody who holds an office under the United States or who, who is an, and who or is an officer of the United States, uh, does that, is that, doesn't it include the president? If the president is not an officer of the United States, then who, who is he? Um, you know, uh, trap liver? Who is he? He's got to be an officer of the United States. For anybody to argue that the president, who is the chief executive officer of the United States, uh, is not an officer of the United States is ridiculous. Well, he's and, an office holder. By definition, he's an officer. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's clear. It's so totally clear. I, I don't know how— Well, the other, you know, the other thing that uh, people are trying to throw in the mix is whether or not he took a proper oath. The proper oath of the president of the United States is that— which refers to in the paragraph uh, 14th Amendment, Section 3. Um, but the presidential's oath is to support and defend the Constitution. It's another ridiculous argument. You know, Correct. It, 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 amazes, it amazes me that, um, you know, some lawyers, uh, academics usually, um, and, uh, you know, some commentators uh, who, need to, who need to fill the airtime, you know, this, this whole Section 3 thing is newsworthy, they need to fill the airtime, so they generate these ridiculous arguments and schmooze around these ridiculous arguments on cable TV. These are all ridiculous arguments. You know, you don't have to be past the third grade to read the language of this provision. And it's not ambiguous in any way. If you have engaged in or given aid or comfort to an insurrection uh, after taking an oath to support and defend the Constitution, you cannot hold the office of the president of the United States. There's no rocket science there at all. It amazes me that people generate these ridiculous issues around it. Um, but if you stop somebody on the street and showed him that language and had him read that language, he would have no choice but to say, this applies. Well, well let me ask you this. Issue? Uh, let me ask you this. I'll take the, um, the devil's advocate position here, and that is, by barring Donald Trump from the ballot, that's undemocratic. Um, could you argue that it's very democratic to bar an insurrectionist from the ballot? I mean, how can you argue? Uh, how could you're an attorney? How could you argue that both ways? Uh, I mean, democratic. That's we're dealing with Section Three of the Fourteenth Amendment. That's that's the only test. That's it. That's what we got. <clears throat> Whether it's democratic whether it should be decided by the courts or a vote of the people, um, you know, whether you flip a coin, doesn't matter. It's this. This is Correct. the language. So, you know, I don't, I don't think it's, you know, it's relevant to ask the question of democratic or everybody should vote for it or, or we should have some other decision process. It's, it's out there completely black and white. Um, and that's the test. Right. You know, uh, Timothy Snyder wrote an article, which you passed on to us, um, called The Pitchfork Ruling, which is to say there's a hesitancy to rule Donald Trump off the ballots, as that might cause violence or insurrection uh, after that point. Um, but it's not the point of the Constitution to avoid such unpleasant situations. The point of the Constitution is the rule of law, is it not? Yeah. It's Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. That's what it is. And uh, Snyder made an interesting and important point. That says con the Constitution is supposed to, um, you know, deal with pitchfork, you know, emotional concerns uh, in the population. Um, and that's why we have a Constitution. If we didn't have a Constitution, we'd be governed by pitchfork. And we can't throw it away uh, imagining that there's people out there who don't like it. That's what governs us. This is the Constitution we must live by. Um, so if there are those who would carry pitchforks on this or any other issue, we have to look to the rule of law. Simple. 
And when they say, and a lot of commentators have said, oh, this is going to you know, raise the ire of, of people and they're going to be out in the streets over it. Hmm, they might be out in the streets on anything if we let them do that. We cannot be concerned about it because it is not the test. The pitchfork test is not the test. It's the Constitution that is the test. It's Section 3 that is the text. You know, Jay, I'm reminded of the 2000 election where the, Supre uh, the Supreme Court of the United States did, in fact, determine an election between uh, George Bush Jr. and Al Gore. Uh, there were a lot of Democrats that weren't happy about it. I don't think they took to the streets with torches and pitchforks. But, you know, none of them said, n not my president. Well, that's their, that's their prerogative to say uh, George Bush was not their president. But nevertheless, the Supreme Court decided an election. Uh, how is this same or different? Well, let me say that Donald Trump ain't no Al Gore. Uh, or George he, Bush. Or George Bush. He, well, yeah. I mean, but Al Gore, you know, conceded the election. Um, George Bush, um, you know, didn't, didn't say the things that Trump has been saying for every election, you know, back to 2016. So, um, you know, I, I think it's really remarkable that we tolerate. It is so outrageous for him to not agree with the popular vote, not agree with the constitutional vote of the of the election, and to claim power without any legal or constitutional basis for it. Um, and I, you know, I'm going back to this section here. Um, if if this section fails, if they gut this section, which I'm afraid the Supreme Court might very well do on on grounds that are not logical and not reasonable and not um, and, and not consistent with the Constitution in general um, and the nature of this country. If they gut Section Three, there will be no Section Three going forward. Zero, it will not exist, and that is a terrible precedent to have them gut a provision of the Constitution. So, um, and, and all in order to give Trump, you know, uh, a place on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I guess uh, to try to answer your question, um, the, the Supreme Court here has the power um, to give Trump a place on the ballot or not. And the only correct answer is to keep him off the ballot because of this very important uh, constitutional amendment. When they say that, oh, this is post-Civil War, I guess they're, and including, you know, a lot of these um, commentators you see on cable, they're saying, oh, this must be related to the Civil War. It doesn't say that. It doesn't talk about the Civil War. <laughs> it's part of the Constitution. It is as powerful and important um, and generally applicable as any part of the Constitution. So I really, as I said before, I don't agree with the nomenclature when they try to link it up with the Civil War. Well, you know, I could argue, and we've said it for five, six, seven years, is that the United States is, in a sense, a very cold Civil War right now. Not a red-hot one or a hot one, but it's a cold one of sorts. The population is polarized uh, between the mega uh, GOP and everyone else. So uh, given that point, um, this whether this was a Civil War clause or not. And you're right, it doesn't mention anything about the Civil War. Um, let me ask you this. I mean, uh, so if there's a political forces abound, uh, be it the Supreme Court or otherwise, that there's a concern about the reaction about taking Donald Trump off the ballot, what about the concerns, uh, the political impacts and insurrection, insurrection impacts of those that insist that he be taken off the ballot? What about their reaction? Oh, I, you know, that's why we have constitutions. That's why we have provisions in the Constitution. Not everybody will agree, but we have this um, matrix of laws, matrix of constitutional provisions. And you know, this country is founded on the essential and um, uh, founding idea that we will abide by what it says. So if they don't like it, they're part of the country that needs to agree with the result. If they like it, they're part of the country that, you know, that are, is obligated to um, follow the result. I, 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 don't, I, I, don't, I don't think it matters if they're in the streets with pitchforks. And that's Tim Snyder's point. It doesn't matter if they're in the street with pitchforks. That's not a test. 
That's not in the Constitution. And if we throw away the Constitution in favor of worrying about pitchforks, we don't have a Constitution anymore. This is very serious what happens here, regardless of the result. Um, so, you know, to me, I don't think that's an argument that plays I mean, the nation does, uh, over time, the nation gets used to the idea. I remember when Roe v. Wade was first decided, I was, I was, uh, I think I was a senior in high school, and, oh, the reaction was tumultuous. But over the 50 years, I mean, people got used to it. And, and certainly in the first initial years, um, it took a while for people to get over that decision. But they did. Um, maybe they didn't, and maybe that's why it took 50 years to try to reverse it. But the point is, uh, what's the value of, of applying a political solution to a legal question? Right. And that's the problem with the Supreme Court now. It's a political court because of the six to three, you know, conservative, I mean, politically conservative majority where you can predict they're going to do conservative on every case or very nearly every case. So, you know, the problem for me is you talk about a, a country that is governed by the Constitution. Well, part of that is you have to have trust and confidence in the institutions that are created by the Constitution. If the Supreme Court is not worthy of our trust and confidence, what then? If the Supreme Court rules against the plain language of this amendment, which we looked at a minute ago, uh, then, you know, what do we have here? We cannot be confident. I mean, I'm losing confidence. I have lost confidence in them already. Um, but I'm not 330 million Americans. If 330 million Americans read it as English and they find arcane ways and arguments to get around it, all in favor of Trump, uh, what are people going to think? What is the country going to think? It will erode public confidence, even among the people who support the result. And, and our Constitution, our country will be in great jeopardy for the lack of confidence in the institutions created by the rule of law. You know, I'm thinking of one of the higher um, officers, not of the United States, but one of the higher executives that were prevented from being placed on a ballot for president of the United States, and that was Jefferson Davis. I'm sure there were many southern states that wanted to see his name on the ballot for president of the United States, but that didn't happen. And uh, I suspect that was a very patriotic and democratic thing to do. He tried to over, well, he did. He, he seceded the leader of, of secession from the uh, United States. Interesting. You know, it's like Al Gore. He acceded um, to the law. Uh, in this case, the law had been confirmed um, by Lincoln um, and, you know, by, by the North in that war. Let me add, too, that... Um, you know, there's the whole issue that came up with uh, Nikki Haley about what the Civil War was about, and she came up with this third grade kind of explanation. It was, it was about, um, you know, the rights of the North versus the South or something really mush. All, and, free, and all free people. I, I free didn't get God. it either, but... It was my, right. You know, I don't know what she was saying, but she didn't talk about slavery or enslavement. Um, and in a recent... Uh, Article. I don't know if you noticed it by um, uh, that writer that we both like, Heather Cox Richardson. Um, she went through it in some detail, exactly you know what uh, Lincoln's um, view of the world was, and and the problems that he had in expressing his opposition to slavery. It was a real issue involving a lot of states that wanted to have slavery. This. Um, through and even after the Civil War. And, and so um, he was able to settle that down and save the Union and, and toss slavery. Uh, what an incredible guy. And I don't know if we give him full credit. She did. Heather Cox Richardson explained, you know, the, um, the issues and problems and machinations and strategies that were involved in getting rid of slavery. Um, but I think we have to recognize that the Union was in great jeopardy then. And I think we have to recognize that the Union is in great jeopardy now. Great point. Well, speaking of jeopardy, let's talk about the, the appeal that Donald Trump's attorneys uh, threw out today. And that is um, to argue the point whether or not the President of the United States, any President of the United States, but specifically Donald Trump, uh, is immune from prosecution, be it criminal or civil, while holding a seat as president of the United States. 
Um, I think this one's pretty clear, <laughs> pretty straightforward. But what's what's your thought about uh, the attempt to say that Donald Trump is immune from uh, political, excuse me, from criminal or civil liabilities? Um, it's poppycock. As, as every <laughs> argument that he makes, he's just thrown it on the wall to see if it sticks. And the other thing, tactically, he's trying to push those trials off. So he wants to, you know, uh, you know, get get some kind of appeal process going and hope that it won't happen right away. And it won't happen right away. Um, you know, Jack Smith was, uh, I'm sure, disappointed to find the Supreme Court would not handle that issue on an expedited basis. So we'll have to see when they come up with something. Uh, if they don't decide it until after the election, that gives Trump a, a tremendous, tremendous benefit. You know, in today's news, I, I heard the grand bargain being thrown out there. The grand bargain is, well, the Supreme Court will allow him to be uh, remain on the ballot, but as compensation, they'll um, expedite the trial dates. They won't string it out and, and, and delay it. Um, I, I thought that was incredibly crazy that uh, the Supreme Court would act as some kind of um, political um, blind justice, if you will. That, that's not in Section 3 of Article 14. That's that's making it out of whole cloth. It sounds like one of those um, um, an untoward negotiations, in quotes, that happen in the Middle East where nobody is serious. That's not serious. Supreme Court, if the Supreme Court does that, again, uh, they would lose all credibility. Um, there's no negotiation here. It's either he's on the ballot or he's off the ballot, and that is a matter of law and, may I say, the English language. Thank you. Uh, what do you think, and I know this is a, I know, you know, sometimes I'm prone to asking a silly question now and then. Uh, what do you think would happen if Donald Trump prevailed and he was seen to be immune uh, uh, for his act actions as president of the United States? What would this country go, what would this country be like? Well, we've talked about that, haven't we? We've talked about what would happen on day one, where he would turn the country, you know, in one business day, he would turn the country into an autocracy and make himself a dictator. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have to worry about day two, because by day two, it would already be an autocracy, wouldn't it? Um, so if he, if he is able to prevail um, on one or both of these issues, that is, if he can stay on the ballot, uh, and if he can get a determination from the Supreme Court, ridiculous determination, that he is immune from criminal prosecution. Um, and if he wins, as we have discussed, uh, it's really the end of the United States as we have known it. And uh, there, uh, there's no other way to look at it. Yeah. You know, we talked about this years ago that the Department of Justice wrote a memo saying President of the United States is immune from prosecution uh, while sitting in the, uh, the chair as president criminal or civil prosecution. Uh, the remedy for the president would be um, impeachment. That's the only remedy. Uh, so let's, let's, let's move forward and say the Supreme Court decides definitively that uh, no president is immune from criminal or civil prosecution. Uh, how does that send a message to all future presidents? Do you think we, get, we avoid in the future the Richard Nixons of the world, um, people that become president, think they could do what they want, as they want, when they want? Would that be a healthy thing to get a Supreme Court decision uh, defining what immunity is for the president? Mm, you're begging the question. <laughs> Always. <laughs> what else is new? <laughs> and the answer is, uh, you know, uh, we don't, we want to say to presidents they can do anything we want, anything they want. Uh, they, you know, they become autocrats. They become dictators. We lose the rule of law. If they do crimes, uh, they need to be prosecuted and convicted and impeached, whatever it is. And, and um, my, my concern is, is that um, if, if we make him immune, uh, we, we will have no control over what he does or less control. And we cannot afford to do that. And so, um, I mean, we want to tell the presidents, all presidents, Republican, Democrat, everybody, um, that they should not you know, commit crimes while they were in office, period. Remember the prophetic statement he said as a candidate in 2015 
that if I shoot someone on Fifth Avenue, no one would care. Basically, that was the his his statement. Um, I guess he really believed it because he's asking for the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeals at this point uh, that he is immune. Well, at the time he said that, it was a ridiculous statement. It's still a ridiculous statement. However, he is trying to create an environment where it wouldn't be ridiculous that he could shoot somebody in Fifth Avenue would be immune from prosecution. I mean, I think it's amazing even to you know, countenance this, even to consider it by anyone. Um, but here we are considering another outrageous statement. You know, it's not just that Trump lies 30,000 times in office. It's not just that. Um, it's also that he makes outrageous statements and people take it. His base takes it and a lot of other people take his statements, which are completely outrageous, and give them credence of some kind. It, it runs a parallel to all the lies. We cannot afford to accept that. We have to use our education, our critical thinking skills, and not accept that from him or anyone else. That's the price of democracy. Well, lying is one of the top tenets of propaganda and quite effective for those that aren't prepared for it, that don't recognize propaganda when they hear it, when they see it, and then when they see people repeat it. So uh, spot on, Jay. Uh, last words, we're out of time. Last words for uh, either his immunity uh, request, uh, his appeal for immunity, or where we stand right now with the 14th Amendment, Section 3, and states' decisions to either keep him on the ballot or, or remove him. Uh, I'll go in reverse order. As I mentioned, I, I think the language of this section is so clear, and it really bothers me that um, academicians and scholars, even um, they, have, you know, they they have to fill the time on 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 the media by coming up with some kind of news story on it. But the fact is, it's clear. There are no good arguments against it. None. And I don't, I, I'm very mm, pessimistic, however, what the Supreme Court might do. But I think in, you know, in the truth of it, in the reality of it, there are no issues. Uh, he is not qualified. He did an insurrection. He organized, he planned it, and he gave aid and comfort afterward. And he took a vote, an oath of office. And, and he definitely is an officer, was an officer of the United States. We cannot afford to have him, just as the, the, the proponents of this amendment said in the first place, we, could, we cannot afford to have him be an officer of the United States again. He is disqualified by every word in that, in that section. On the question of um, immunity, immunity, uh, what immunity? There's no immunity in the Constitution. There's no immunity in the law. If some untoward, uh, politicized uh, member of the DOJ said that he should not be prosecuted, that is not the law. And the presumption is that if you conduct a crime, um, the, uh, the justice organizations in this country should prosecute you, and a jury, if you like, should be um, impaneled uh, to rule on guilt and innocence. Um, and you, you need to pay a price. We have to have accountability. If we don't have accountability, um, we will have autocracy. We'll have dictatorship. And the country will go into further decline. We are already in decline because of Trump, what Trump was doing in his first term. In his second term, he could really put the pennies on the eyes. All right, Jay. I like how clear you are on this topic because it's probably one of the more top, important topics that we'll see for many, many years to come, and certainly in 2024. I want to thank you for your contribution. I'd just like to add that um, when we discuss the 14th Amendment, Section 3, um, we look at the oath of office that Donald Trump took, any politician takes, and that is to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And somehow, I don't know, when you try to stop the transference, a peaceful trans, um, transition from one president to the next, uh, and you, you mix in an insurrection, in, in the middle of it, and in fact, he did. He did stop the peaceful transference. There was a delay, and um, we'll see if he's guilty of that with the uh, criminal case against him. But uh, as far as 14th Amendment, Section 3, as you say, Jay, it's clear as, as you read it. And with that... Let, let me add Let me add one other point. That's, I don't think the media makes enough uh, attention to it. Is They say, oh, this is an insurrection. 
oh, this is, um, you know, uh, an attempt to um, defer the vote. This was more than that. This was an attempted coup, C-O-U-P, coup. That's, that's outrageous. Uh, that is... Yeah, that uh, kind of gets lost in uh, the discussions on TV, doesn't it? It's treason. It's undoing the government in, in order to achieve your own power. It's taking the reins of power without any legal basis whatsoever. And, and that's what he did. So it's, to me, it's not only insurrection, it's worse than insurrection. Great point. Thank you, Jay. Join us next week for American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And by the way, if you like what you just saw in this program, click like and, and, and follow us. We'd really appreciate that. And until next week, aloha.